Hallo. Hey guys. Hey. Hello. Hi. Hi everyone. Okay, I'm just Hello. trying to make a P. Hello. Yeah, we'll wait for a couple of minutes and we'll start. And cool. And now Tan, uh, ENS team, and uh, for the first session, I think uh, we'll ask Vitalik and uh, uh, Alex from uh, XDI team to just uh, present their proposals. So like I'll yeah. make these people as a co-host. So Nick, Brownlee. And also please make a co-host uh, Kirill from our team also. Oh, then. Uh, how, how to spell ki Kirill? Kirill. Kirill. Okay. So whoever in a co-host team can uh, present uh, your slide if you have some. And okay, great. Okay. Hey, so, good morning. Hey. Good morning. Hey, Nick. Uh, hey, Nick. And Bradley. So I just want everyone to know how much Nick, you know, loves you guys in this project. At what time? It's like, was it 5 a.m. or something? 5.01, yep. There you go. He, he took the hard time. Yeah. And I think some people, like, for example, Vitalik is in somewhere in Asia. It's middle of the night. So. Oh, that's right. Vitalik also is, is sacrificing yeah. greatly. Okay. Uh, let me just add. Okay, so let's just start. Uh, I'll just share my screen first. And after that. Uh, okay, can you guys see my screen? Yeah? Can. Okay. So thank you very much for everybody joining the ENS online workshop. Uh, so as mentioned in that uh, email, it's gonna split into the four parts. And this is the first part, which we're gonna talk about uh, layer two solution to like how to support ENS in a layer two uh, area. And uh, so far we've seen a couple of pro uh, proposals, uh, Vitalik posted one solution and the uh, XDI team has uh, some solution. And also Nick has some kind of specific solution for the DNS one. Uh, one. So you could either speak Included here or the next session, it's up to you, Nick. Uh, but like, yeah. For, so for next fifty minutes, for each session between between, I'm trying to take like five ten minutes a break. So like, yeah, I'll stop like five, uh, like fifty. Uh, okay. Uh, with further ado, so yeah, next one. Yeah. So this is a schedule, and the, this session we and the, if. So what I'm trying to do is like probably for anyone who wants to present, uh, give a like present like 10, 15 minutes about what your proposal is. And the, this is more about the unconference. So which we want to encourage people to basically ex ask questions, express opinions. So uh, I don't know how it works with this over 20 people, but if you have questions, uh, it's either you can try to raise, I don't know how exactly it works, but like you can raise hands or you can just speak. Uh, if it gets like, you know, uh, too much trouble or like people just intercepting each other, then we might ask you to start asking questions on the text so I can read. But uh, this is the first session. So any like, you know, uh, not working well, bear with me. So with further ado, uh, so we have, yeah, three options, general purpose L2 friendly in a standard by Vitalik and the optimistic bridge uh, by uh, yeah, Alex and XDI team. Uh, any preference, which one you wanna go first? Well, Vitalik, do you have any presentation to present or are you you just gonna- I do, I have slides. You do have some slides. Uh, okay, so Vitalik, do you wanna go first? Sure. Um, okay, um, should I, um, it says uh, my screen sharing will stop your screen sharing. So, okay, I'll yeah. do yes. Um, and then there, share. Um, okay, um, do you see my slides? 
We do, yes. Discuss. Okay, excellent. Um, how much time do I have again, by the way? Uh, uh, 50 minutes. Is it now? Uh, one five? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to eat longer? No, no, that's fine. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, general purpose uh, and of layer two static cause proposal. So this is my uh, attempt at a general proposal for basically how to support or static calls for in um, going into um, layer two systems in general. And, and one of well, the initial motivating use case was uh, resolving domains and ENS, but this could potentially be applied to static calls in uh, decentralized applications, you know, running in layer two protocols in general. Uh, so it's intended to be uh, kind of deliberately broad. Uh, so first, uh, kind of quickly going through the problem. Uh, so ENS is currently expensive. Um, you know, we all know this. Um, the cost of registering a domain is like somewhere around above a dollar, and it's very possible that the cost might increase further. And the scaling strategy that is currently dominant is uh, in the Ethereum ecosystem is using layer two protocols, right? Um, so we have ZK rollups, we have uh, OMG network and, and their plasma system, we have um, optimistic rollups, and there's also uh, um, obviously the uh, kind of uh, federation trusted in like uh, token backed sidechains and all of those systems as well. So we have this proliferation of uh, layer two protocols. There's lots of them, but our current ENS infrastructure depends on uh, domains being on layer one. And um, so the thrust of this proposal is basically saying that ENS should, does not need to commit to a kind of quote migrating to or being on like one specific um, layer two proposal. Instead, you can basically support them all. Uh, so the goal here is that we assume that there is some layer two that supports registering, transferring, renewing domains, basically any act of other important operations. Uh, so this is just an EOC 721 kind of type NFT with a couple of extra features. Um, but notably, this doesn't necessarily have to be an EVM system, right? So like, for example, it could be like Loopring or ZK Sync could easily just add a feature for um, into their um, ZK rollups that's, um, that just explicitly support transferring domain names and they would totally not support the rest of the EVM, but they would just support like, moving domains around. Or they might support a, a couple of other very specific applications. Our goal is that we want to support reading from the L2 um, and we want to read from the layer two without any on-chain operations on the layer one or the layer two in the happy case, right? Um, reads, should, like, reads should be passive operations. So here is the general approach. Um, so the approach is that um, layer two contracts, uh, so the contract that like, where if you have some asset inside of the layer two system, like, where that asset would actually live on layer one, like kind of the contract that, that um, serves as that kind of bridge, that contract would be expected to support a, a static call interface. And so it would be expected to support this interface that basically you pass as input uh, an account, uh, the call data, and uh, a block number, and it would return um, asynchronously the um, output data. And the output would be the result of calling that particular account inside of that L2, given um, uh, this particular call data, using the post state of a particular block number. Um, so a couple of uh, kind of things here, right? So first of all, like this is clearly a, a kind of ABI based standard. It assumes you have a kind of EVM style calling happening. So if um, it's a ZK rollup that's, or if, it, or if it's a plasma, or if it's some more limited system implementing this standard, then like the limited system would basically just have to support like kind of decoding the ABI for like this one specific feature that they support, right? So that, like that's totally fine. Like basically if you have a um, layer two that's just um, designed around like say moving domain names around and it's a ZK rollup, then like the static call interface, it would still have to kind of parse um, the call data, return the output data, do some ABI decoding just for that one specific function. And the goal here is basically so that 
um, whatever process we have that calls the static call interface doesn't need to know anything about the internals of the layer two, right? So we're trying to kind of really firewall it off and make it generic and we say, whatever the layer two does internally, that's its own thing. And, and if, if he wants to call the layer two, um, the layer two then like, you call it with uh, this sign of common interface, right? So that's the first point. And the second point is um, that the response is asynchronous and the, re the input is, um, includes the block number, right? So the reason why we want to support historical post states is basically because we want to uh, support uh, kind of challenge games, right? So we want to support uh, the ability of, of someone to publish a message saying this is like this actually is the output of these inputs, and if you uh, think I'm wrong, then you can go challenge me, and the challenge actually is guaranteed to provide the same results. Uh, and so if the uh, internal state of the layer two changes in the meantime, that doesn't matter because well, the, the static call was done uh, kind of based off of a historical state anyway. Um, so, base, um, right, so moving on. Um, so this is uh, kind of the general, the thing that layer two protocols are expected to support, right? And you might notice that it, we are trusting the layer two protocol to uh, kind of honestly respond to a static calls. But the reality is that like, if you have your domain inside of a layer two, then you're already trusting the layer two. And so like, we're not really adding any extra trust assumptions here, right? Like if you, basically, if you own a domain, then like you should have your domain inside of a layer two that actually supports this interface because that way it would resolve. Um, so in terms of how this would work at a high level, right? If you, um, the idea would be that um, if I have uh, some domain and I might have it on the layer one, I might have it on the layer two, and you want to resolve it, the way that you would resolve it is um, step one, <coughs> you would obviously check for that domain on the Ethereum blockchain itself. And if it is on the Ethereum blockchain, then great. Um, if it's not on the Ethereum blockchain, then you would check if, like, kind of progressively check if any of the super domains of that domain are on uh, the on, directly on the layer one, right? So if I want to check like Vitalik.status.eth, then first it would check is Vitalik.status.eth uh, kind of on uh, ENS in Ethereum. If yes, great. If not, it would check well is status.eth uh, kind of direct on Ethereum. Um, if not, um, if it is, um, then um, if it is, then it would check, well, is status.eth owned by a layer two contract? And if either vitalik.status.eth or status.eth, like if the domain itself or any of the super domains is owned by a layer two contract, then you would resolve the domain by basically running this game um, based um, and uh, calling into this um, static call interface of the layer two system. Um, so now, now we get to the challenge game, right? So this static call interface, this is on chain, right? And, specific, and even worse, it's uh, on layer one, right? So if he wants to use the static call interface, then basically what you would have to do is um, you would um, have to publish a transaction um, then um, that would go on chain uh, and then the output data would come back on chain. Now, we don't want to use the chain if we don't have to, and so like, this is what the challenge game is for. Um, okay, just a quick, someone, um, uh, Adrienne Kubla asked a question. Uh, so if you wanna make sure your domain is off properly, you wanna use it on layer two, you need to prevent anyone from registering it on layer one. Um, okay, so basically what happens here is you have to do one of a couple. Um, so for, this is one really important point, right? In no case would it be possible to register the same domain either on layer two or on layer one, right? For any specific domain, either it's registrable on layer one or and only on layer one, or it's registrable on layer two and only on layer two. Like there is no point at which you have a choice. Uh, and the idea would basically be um, that 
if a super domain of that domain is um, registered on, is, is held by a layer two contract. So like if, for example, status decides to migrate their, um, their ENS subdomains to layer two, what they would do is, and let's say status like wants to, wants to use some future version of Loopring, then status would move um, status.eth over to the Loopring contract. And then inside of the Loopring contract, uh, you would be able to, um, register and move around uh, subdomains of uh, status.eth, right? Uh, so basically, if you move your domain, uh, if you move your domain to a, um, or if you move a domain to a yeah, layer two, one of these layer two resolvers, then that allows uh, subdomains to be registered inside of that, part uh, that particular layer two. Um, is the idea, right? So it's so basically, which layer two gets used as a, a kind of per super domain uh, choice. So the challenge game, right? So this is what happens uh, off chain. Uh, so this is a fairly standard uh, kind of a tester, um, crypto economic a tester game. Uh, so we have this class of actors called a testers. Anyone can be an a tester if they're willing to deposit some ETH or potentially other tokens into an a tester contract. Uh, the a tester contract um, has a, a two week delay before you can withdraw. And any requester that wants a response uh, can send a request to an attester. And the request basically says, here's the layer two contract address, and here's the account, and here's the call data that I want to call. And if the attester supports that particular layer two, so they can check from the layer two contract address if they support it, if they do support it, they send a response. And the response basically contains the, um, the request, um, then a block number, um, basically, the attester can just choose what the latest block number is, um, the, the output of actually making that static call, and a signature from the attester. And the attester sends this back to the requester, and the requester rebroadcasts all responses to a challenge network. Um, so, right, so, so far, this is, um, oh, well, I accidentally duplicated the slide. This is uh, kind of the picture here, right? So the requester sends the question, the, tensor, the tester gives the answer, and the requester forwards it along to a challenge network. So what happens on the challenge network? Basically, you have some set of challengers, and challengers, um, when they see these objects that contain um, the call, the output, uh, um, the claimed output of the call and the signature, um, they locally run the call and they check, well, does the response match um, the response that they get if they run it locally? And if it does not match, then the attester um, sends the, um, basically passes along this um, response from the attester to the attester contract. The attester contract then calls the contract of the layer two system. Then the contract of the layer two system actually uh, performs uh, some procedure to uh, like basically a, a resolution procedure to determine um, on layer one to determine well what actually is the truth on layer one and provides the output and then um, that output gets pushed back to the attester contract and if the eventual output disagrees with the attester's answer then the attester gets slashed the challenger gets a reward um, so um, okay um, Question from us, um, is there any reason to have the full historical record? Seems it wouldn't make sense um, for a testers. Hmm, not sure I understand the question. Like, what do you mean by the full historical record here? I mean, um, if the, the reason you need a historical record is just to, to make sure that, like, I don't make a challenge and then change the domain, then it seems that like, I don't, wouldn't really need it after, let's say, 24 hours, right? Like I, I only need to keep the last 24 hours of history, and if the domain hasn't changed in the last right. 24 hours, then that's okay. Right. Uh, so, well, it de it depends. Well, basically, I don't want to make assumptions about what happens inside of the L2, right? So, like, I don't want to make assumptions that you know the layer two kind of treats like has a particular way of treating history or has a particular way of treating state. I mean, if we want, what we could do is we could, like be, like a testers could individually choose and say, oh, they're only going to accept block numbers that are, um, or respond using block numbers that are within the last 24 hours. Uh, so 
I don't think this requires anyone to store the full historical record. I think like you, in in a, a kind of sensibly designed uh, block number, and then um, you can, or in a sensibly designed layer two, like you should not need to store more than a small amount of, of uh, history, or even just the current state. Um, do we need to add a bound on block number? Um, otherwise, you could build on a tester that always returns null block number zero. Um, good question. I think my answer to this would be that in, a testers have the, the ability to be useless, right? So a testers could even just not respond. Uh, so the this proposal is a kind of deliberately kind of scoped in that it specifies some things and it doesn't specify other things. Uh, so the thing that it specifies is how this challenge a tester game works. The thing that it does not specify is like one, how you choose the testers, uh, two, how you would pay a testers for attestations, if you pay a testers for attestations, three, how you measure the quality of an attester. Like an attester could also be bad quality by just waiting for 30 seconds before responding. Uh, so I'm assuming there's like some other tech set of techniques uh, that proposers use and uh, to choose a testers, and if they're not satisfied with uh, the responses from an attester, they can just like, switch to a different attester. Uh, so, and, and I'm assuming that the economics uh, of uh, well, if someone is um, is going to be is going to attest at all, then if they have that incentive, then they have um, then that seems to imply that they would have an incentive to it. Um, or generally, that implies that those same incentives would would uh, drive them to attest uh, usefully. Right, and, and that can be imposed. So we can have bounds on the block number that can be enforced at proposer side. So I think, or requester side. So like, I think requesters should, like, one way to change the protocol would be to for just requesters to specify a block number. Um, I did not do it that way, basically just um, in order to allow requesters to be a kind of even dumber, like, allow requesters to be more minimalistic and not even know what the late, what, what the recent block numbers are. But if we want, we could switch the protocol and force the, the, the requester to provide a block number then the attest, the attester has to return with that specific block number if they return at all, that's fine. I don't really care. Um, and there, there's, uh, I guess, just to give a few more seconds for people to uh, look at the diagram. Um, how does this impact composability, right? I guess, so in this, so basically and it affects composability the same way that any proposal that involves uh, domain names being inside of a layer two affects composability, right? So. If you have a domain that's inside of a layer two, then presumably that domain would only be, um, like you could only use it for synchronous interactions with the uh, things that exist in um, in the same rollup as, uh, or in the same layer two. Um, and then if he wants to withdraw it from that layer two, then of course you can, right? So if you want to, uh, well actually, so, so here's the fun thing actually, if you, like if, for example, we have like just continuing my examples, you have like status decides they want to use a loop ring by default. So status.eth ends up being owned by the loop ring contract. And then I register vitalik.status.eth and it's inside of loop ring. Then let's say I don't like loop ring anymore. And so I withdraw it. Like I basically, I would do some withdrawal procedure inside of loop ring to withdraw um, and then that now I own a Vitalik.status.eth on the Ethereum base chain, and uh, the protocol would still resolve uh, resolve that properly, right? Because it checks whether or not Vitalik.status.eth is on the layer one first. And then let's say I want to move it back to some layer two, and so I move it back. To, I, I move uh, Vitalik.status.eth back to say yeah, or zk sync um, or like the Optimism network, and then I am. Um, then what would happen is that on layer one, vitalik.status.eth would be owned by the optimism contract. And so the, the, resol um, the resolving process would basically notice that vitalik.status.eth is owned by the optimism contract. And then it would play the challenge response game um, you, based on the uh, layer two that's, well, based on the optimism, uh, 
by talking to the optimism uh, contract and then it would require a challenge response game with some a tester that understands how to interpret like, that is an uh, optimism full node uh, so in terms of like portability of uh, things across the layer two is um, you can totally do it um, but synchronous interactions um, have the same property that synchronous um, interactions have in general, which is like you can do them inside of one system, but you can't generally can't easily do them um, between systems. Right. Uh, so security properties. Um, so if an a tester makes a single invalid response. And, and people actually follow the rules and they make sure to rebroadcast all the responses to the challenge network, then basically um, a challenger will notice this and a challenger will uh, make a uh, challenge, uh, will make a challenge and on the layer one, um, a challenge in progress will begin immediately. Right? And other requesters can ignore testers that have active challenges in progress, right? So if basically, if let's say I'm in, you're in a tester and you are providing me some attestations, and then I notice on chain that, oh, look, oh, wait, somebody's challenging you, then I'm like, my uh, kind of algorithm is to say, oh, well, that means that I don't know, but that means that maybe you're a cheater. And so I'm going to go talk to other testers instead. Now, the, re the reason why this isn't uh, kind of an extreme DOS vector is basically because false challenges burn the challenger's deposit. So the challenger would have to deposit someone else to challenge. And so any challenge is going to burn somebody's ETH. Either it burns the challenger's ETH or it burns uh, the attester's ETH. Um, so for, for cheating to be net profitable, a malicious attester basically needs to find some way to cheat more people than the size of their deposit in like basically a, a few rounds of network latency plus one block time, right? Because as soon as you cheat someone and as soon as that propagates, it goes on to chain and go all and like on layer one immediately. And so like you as an attester, like basically temporary, like, well, temporarily disqualify yourself very quickly, and then the layer two game plays itself, and you would permanently disqualify yourself after like one or two weeks or however long the, however long that game takes. Um, and if we want more layers of protection, then a test, um, requesters can ask for multiple attestations from multiple attesters, um, and potentially a yeah, requester can ask the challenge network for other requests um, that, uh, that have been made recently. Uh, so the requester can, try, can basically see, oh, well, has that particular tester also made a lot of other attestations at the same time? And if they have, then you could uh, kind of discount your uh, level of trust for that particular tester as well, right? So there's a lot of things that we can do to try to mitigate uh, malicious attesters that try to kind of do a whole bunch of, a whole a bunch of cheating at the same time but a, a whole bunch of cheating at the same time is basically the uh, uh, the only attack vector here um, so not covered here um, so how layer two is actually implement historical static calls uh, so this is a per layer two like a, a very layer two specific thing um, in an optimistic role, you can base an execution proof off any state route in a plasma system. You can do an exit game uh, and just cut off uh, block routes after some point in time. And how requesters pay for an attestation could be through a channel, could be a free service, uh, could be a whole bunch of ways that's kind of deliberately out of scope. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Vitalik. Uh, Nick, do you have any comment or, or observation or questions? Uh, several. Um, I'll, I, I think it would be good to get input from lots of people, but I am aware we have another presentation as well. So I'll start with mine. Um, there's some interesting edge cases there around how the system behaves when uh, the domain changes ownership in L1 uh, in that uh, the attestations from the old system will become invalid. Um, which we'd need to think about carefully. Um, a second thing is we've, we've already planned potentially a wildcard resolution, which would require a change to resolvers. You could potentially have wildcard testers, which would allow um, 
which would make it possible for systems to adopt both L2 support and wildcard support without having to individually support both of them. Um, although that requires a way to assert the execution of historic EVM state on L1, which is problematic. Uh, apparently my microphone's hard to hear, hang on. Um, I think that's worse. Than it's much worse. Maybe just go back to what you okay. said. That was at least workable. All right. Okay. Um, my biggest concern is about the uh, the network. The uh, sorry, I can't remember what Vitalik called it. Um, the net, the challenge network. Um, in that. If it's all to all, then it will scale quite poorly because um, we, we can't have, it would be equivalent to putting every DNS lookup on broadcast. Um, and if it's not, then we somehow need to come up with a network where the requester can be guaranteed somehow that at least in potential challenges will see their, uh, their broadcast message uh, to verify that the attestation is correct um, without themselves having to, to find and talk to them. Uh, which could be a challenge. Um, but in, in general, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about the, the proposal. I, I think it has a lot of lead. Cool. Great. Uh, I think Alex, are you presenting next? Yeah, I'm trying to share the presentation. Yeah, give me a second. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, so uh, eventually, uh, the most of our talk will be done by Kirill. So I will just uh, start uh, because uh, in order to understand uh, the main idea of the, our proposal, you need to understand uh, what is the um, arbitrary message bridge we can we already built and this is already exist between. Uh, uh, LinkyB and XDI chain between Ethereum mainnet and XDI chain. So this is very important. Uh, and uh, the idea here that we could pass any arbitrary message between uh, two EVM based chains. So, and arbitrary message bridge is built on, uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's, it is built on, based on notary scheme. So we have set of uh, oracles which could, uh, you know, uh, watch uh, events in one chain and uh, transfer information uh, and confirm this, uh, you know, appearing of this information to another chain. So, and, uh, you know, uh, by, by doing this, it is, uh, everyone who participate in this side chain, it, uh, they trust this set of uh, oracles and, uh, you know, um, they, it means that uh, they agree with uh, this, uh, th their behavior. So, and the bench, and currently this is, uh, if we explain about the current existing bridges, so it is, uh, so these oracles are set by uh, projects uh, like uh, Protofire, Make MakerDAO, uh, give us, so, uh, and uh, also we participate in this set of oracles. So, and we transfer this information to, uh, and uh, this is the main uh, core, uh, main idea how the information are transferred uh, from one chain to another. So can you please start your presentation to, uh, to present the, our proposal? Hi, sure. Can you stop this picture? Yes. Yeah. So can you uh, go into a little more detail on uh, on how that would work to enable the NS resolution across L2s without on-chain call, on -chain calls for each one? Yeah, can you provide more details how to work on, on for NS mirroring in, for, for in our proposal? So let's start. Uh, I will show you how we developed an ENS MB mirroring between the Ethereum mainnet and the XDI chain, for example. So what do we have initially in our prerequisites? So we should have a two EVM compatible chains. Then we have a 
ENS core contracts are deployed on the layer one chain, which is the Ethereum mainnet, for example. It also should have an arbitrary message bridge established and deployed between the, our chains. And the third point implies that we have some trusted set of bridge oracles and validators, which all users of uh, our layer two chain trust to. And uh, we have our users who want to claim their own ENS records on the layer two chain. So how we can do this? First, let's look at the uh, details of how our arbitrary message bridge is operating in the mainnet to x di direction, how it works. Uh, basically users, which are either externally owned accounts or other smart contracts, they submit bridge requests by calling a specific function on the AMB contract in the mainnet. Here you can see the signature of this function. It's pretty simple. You pass the executor address on the other side of the bridge on the XDI. Then you pass the, uh, your call your call data and you provide some gas limit for this call execution. Then when you call this function, it obviously emits an event and bridge of chain oracles catch this emitted event. They process it somehow and uh, generate a confirmation. And later they send this confirmation to the XDA chain AMB contract. And uh, simply once enough confirmations are collected uh, above some threshold, the message, the message is being executed by making a call to the executor address, providing the call data and specifying some gas limit. It's pretty simple. Then how we can try to use this scheme for mirroring our ENS records. So basically we need four things to do it. We should create a separate mainnet mediator contract, which will communicate between the ENS registry and AMB contract itself, because without it, the ENS knows nothing about AMB and AMB knows nothing about ENS. So we need some intermediary for communication. Then we also should create some XDI mediator contract, which will process uh, mirroring requests from the other side of the bridge. Probably also we need some modified version of the ENS registry on the, which will be deployed on the XDI. And uh, we can use unmodified ENS public resolver or any other resolver on the XDI for user's simple life. So let's look at our initial proposal of how this thing should work. Suppose we have some Alice who all, she owns some uh, subdomain, uh, say Alice.eth, and she wants to transfer to Miro some particular domain name from she's domain space. For example, pay.ls.it. She makes a call to the our ENS mirror mediator, say bridge ENS node. She passes the name hash of this node in the call data. Then what this mediator does, uh, it collects all the necessary information such as ownership information, time to leave, a resolver contract on the Ethereum mainnet. It also can go to the resolver contract as well to get the associated address. And then it combines all this information and uses this uh, AMB contract function required to pass message to transfer this uh, packed information to the XDI chain. And this information is, is being transferred by the trusted oracles. And on the other side of the bridge, uh, on the XDI, we have another AMB contract and this AMB contract finally received the information from the mainnet by using our trusted oracles. And uh, this AMB contract will execute a past message. Say it will be some function update in this node, which will take some, yeah, the transferred, the mirrored, uh, 
DNS domain name and some parameters which we obtained on the main and server layer, such as owner, time to live, and associated address. And it will simply set this all information to the itself. We decided to that it is possible to integrate the ENS registry and DNS mediator in a single contract for simplicity. So it simply makes a call to itself to set the owner, set time to leave, set resolver to the pre-deployed resolver contract. And it also associates the address with the domain. And after that, our Alice on XDI chain can resolve her domain and get the same address as what she get on the Ethereum mainnet. And that was it. So which special cases do we have? What if owner of our ENS record is changed on the main? What should we do in this case? We can simply repeat our mirror requests and this will update the owner on the X day as well. So what if our owner is changed on the X day? Uh, for simplicity and for avoiding some corner cases, we decided that uh, Mediator contract, only mediator contract is allowed to change the owner of the node. And if Alice mirrored some node from the mainnet, then she's not allowed to change the owner on the X day. If she wants to transfer her domain, then first she needs to change the owner on the mainnet and then pro propagate this change to the X day. And uh, how to handle all other different ENS record parameters. So current node owner can change everything but the owner address itself on next day. And if owner is updated, then new node holder can reconfigure everything as he wishes on the X day as well. So can we mirror other data types through this kind of bridge? Some text records, public keys, something else. Well, definitely yes we once owner is set for the, some ens node on the x day he or she can communicate in the same manner as he did on the ethereum mainnet by communicating with the public resolver and since the public resolver is left unmodified it will be it can be done in the same way so what the problem we have that with this initial approach is that it required for the user to spend some gas on the mainnet for making this request and nowadays the gas is pretty expensive so we want to omit this expensive mainnet transactions so the questions are can we do so and if we can then how bridge validators can safely and securely pass this information from the xdi from the mainnet to the X day chain. So we seem a little bit changed our approach the following way. So first the Alice makes the backwards request starting from the X day. How she can do this? So she calls some function which will make the request she calls some mirror ENS node requests, again passing her domain name and our ENS mediator contract uh, calls our AMB contract on the X day. This call will request our oracles to retrieve the information from the mainnet and then pass it back. So this is how the request is happening on the X day then what happens after the oracles which received this previously made request they can go to the mainnet and simply perform a static if call operation which does not uh, require to spend some if to execute it so they simply make this call this call is done through the amb contract it calls the mediator contract this contract collects all the necessary information in the same way it did it earlier and passes all this information back and 
All these values are returned as a result of the if call operation. And then what oracles do, they combine all this information, they pass it back to the AMB contract, and this AMB contract, once enough confirmations from the oracles are collected, the AMB contract can safely call the callback function, and this callback function will will set up all these necessary fields in the same way it did it earlier. And finally, Alice as well can now you know resolve her domain, which was originally located on the mainnet, but now it is also mirrored on the egg day. That was it. Hope you have some questions. Has this been deployed into the one testnet? Well, yeah, it was deployed on some sort of colon and Sokol, I guess, but not seriously. Like, uh, I think colon we don't have a ENS unless you deploy your own. Yeah, yeah, I deployed my own version, something like that. It's not official. Oh, so I misunderstood. This isn't a proposal of what you could build. This is something you've already built. Yeah, we did some proof of concept for it, and it works. And, uh, like, Very nice. It was already built. I, I think it's it's worth do, sort of comparing and contrasting. There's there's two very different approaches to scalability. Uh, sorry, to L two that have been suggested here. Um, Vitalix retains the idea that, uh, it, that a single resolver should be able to resolve all mains at all levels, um, but that it's no longer possible to resolve domains on L2s. Um, this proposal instead works on mirroring and uh, makes it possible to resolve domains on chain on L2s that support it but requires more on naturally more on chain operations and the risk of, of records being out of date. So it's quite, they're quite different in their approach, I think. Um, and the, I think Vitalik's approach focuses more on scaling things via L2 and that it, you, you can commit a domain to an L, a specific L2 and um, that way avoid having to make transactions on L1 whereas this focuses more on enabling resolution on specific L2s, in this case, XDI. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I think this is correct. Um, and of course, the two don't have to be mutually exclusive. We can, you know, they, they each have uh, different use cases, but um, in terms of what we dedicate our resources to going forward, we have to sort of carefully examine what the goals of ENS on L2 are. Yeah, and the, the fact that uh, this uh, this approach could be built already on um, on, on existing bridge, so we already have a bridge between uh, Ethereum mainnet and XDAI, and uh, this already could be used uh, because we have oracles, we have MB deployed, so we can try it uh, and see how uh, how how it fits for uh, application needs, right? Yeah, can I? Uh, so the, the this idea born there because people asked uh, uh, for ENS support and uh, we didn't want to deploy the, the protocol. We wanted to reuse uh, existing ENS uh, records on layer one, which is uh, I think fundamentally right. So that's uh, that's how it's uh, it's created. It's not because we like explored uh, something uh, on our own. It's uh, because you know people actually ask like. What is the way to, to to bridge it with like minimal um, uh, resources? Um, one question. So, you you guys already know that this works on X die specific solution. Are do you know? Are there any other L two side chain solution you could just use the same approach without not much modification, like Matic and the other ones? Yeah, it can yeah, be used anywhere. Mm -hmm. With yeah, the, 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 
Yeah, the main, the main, uh, the main. Uh, so our requisite that both chain could should be AVM compatible. So if the chain is AVM compatible, like Matic or Ava, so Avalanche, so we can run uh, this solution on all these chains. Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, and, and uh, just want to add that uh, in our uh, optimistic uh, bridge, which is. Uh, our next version of the bridge, so there is no need of uh, Oracle to relay these messages, so um, that can be relayed by anyone. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, who runs the uh, AMB uh, Oracles? Uh, well, for, for now, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, like a community driven project, uh, so it's an organization from community. We started this with uh, Giveth and uh, um, with MakerDAO. So like, uh, and the protofire, so like four companies are uh, running in uh, three or four uh, threshold signature. And for governance, uh, there is a six of 11 also from community. So, but it's relatively easy to increase number of, uh, of, uh, of signatories. So that's, uh, it's not a, we have only one signature if it's, if it's a question, right? So we cannot, uh, yeah, we cannot do much uh, on our own. Cool. Any other questions? Mm, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I think we have to call a bit of the time anyway. Um, but thank you for to everyone who presented, and and uh, I think we've got some interesting stuff to go forward with, which we'll have to take uh, asynchronous on on the forum. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, so we have like a yeah, discussion forum and also we have a Discord channel. So you can, if you're interested uh, continuing this conversation, like you can continue. But for now, we'll take a 10 minutes break and we'll re some of you guys rejoin for the uh, next topic of the uh, DNS, yeah, DNS uh, rollback. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.